there. We will dispel a few myths around open access and we'll point you to a few places to learn more. Um, we're happy to answer any questions, although we'll answer them at the end of the presentation, but feel free to put any questions that you have into the chat box and we'll get to that later. Um, so we want to start talking about our experience with open access. I first learned about open access at a previous institution where I took a, a workshop on building your scholarly identity. And I learned one way to build your identity is through open access and putting your papers in an open access repository. Um, so that's what I started to do. And it's been really fun to see um, how many people are accessing my papers through the repository. And sometimes you can get data like where are they from and which organization they're from. And I um, started interacting with open access and appreciating how important it can be as a librarian at a community college in Metro Denver, where we had certain databases, but when students got to more advanced or in-depth projects, we were really lacking some of the resources that they needed. Um, and so we could request things from other libraries to a certain extent, but finding open access materials was a really important way to address uh, the needs and the questions that students had. And then I had an interesting experience around open access when I first joined um, the University of Colorado Boulder Libraries. We were contacted by a staffer um, of the Joint Budget Committee for the legislature of Colorado who um, needed scholarly information for an issue that they were researching for the Joint Budget Committee and hoped that from one state institution to another at CU Boulder, we could share our access to our databases. And it turned out that's not the case. We have really strict licensing agreements for our paid content um, that it's really restricted to CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty. And so we were not able to share our database access with the staffers of the Joint Budget Committee. And so talking about open access resources became a really important way to help them find some scholarly information to work through their issues. So those are just a couple examples that helped me really appreciate the power and the value of open access. So we wanted to share kind of this definition that we both liked about open access, that it's really broad. So this quote says, open source, open access, open education, open data, open science, all of these movements share a commitment to the removal of barriers to access scholarly communication and restrictions for use. And to me, what's really key about this is just how it ties these various components together to this shared value and shared ethic behind the open access movement. So I wanted to share some highlights um, of what, where the open access movement came from. And it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, we could trace this back to the real start back to the 1970s. You may know about Project Gutenberg that makes public domain works available that started in the 70s and was influenced by text encoding initiatives of the 1980s. Um, and open access really emerged out of the open source movements of the 70s and 80s that aimed to democratize the infrastructure of the internet and valued the free and uninhibited circulation of information. But STEAM really started to pick up in the 1990s when open access began to coalesce as a concept. So some early highlights are um, archive this um, open repository for sharing scholarly content. Um, the first open access journals came about in the 90s. And then a ton happened in the 2000s. The main principles behind the movement branched off into various open access initiatives. So we had journal publishing, preprint publishing, major national and institutional policies around open access and grassroots work, um, tech and infrastructure initiatives, as well as interest in larger corporations getting in on open knowledge. And then in the, getting into the 2010s, um, this time was marked by steady progress in all of the areas and strategies that had emerged in the 2000s. Though it could be said that there hasn't been a whole lot of new innovation um, during the 2010s, but um, our colleague, Melissa Cantrell, our scholarly communication librarian, thinks of this era of the 2010s as the formalization of open access. So several projects were launched during this time to help larger systematics problems. 
um, really aiming at access to research literature. And so some of these were totally legal. And then there were others like Sci-Hub uh, crossing the line into illegal posting of content. But what's interesting is all of these projects are really symptomatic of a scholarly communication system that's not working for researchers and the public. So there have also been these increasingly big moves by large publishing corporations to buy and acquire software in the scholarly communication lifecycle. Elsevier is especially known for this. So we're seeing large corporations often turning a movement that was really based in collectivity and sharing of profits um, into a movement that has uh, been focused more on profits and might be, might be um, blindsiding some of the progress of the movement in some ways. But winding up here in the 2020, um, there's more than 900 institutions and organizations with open access policies or repositories in the United States. So we're just seeing this huge shift and this huge embrace. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to touch on before we move on to the next section is the serials crisis. So academic libraries pay about 90% of the costs for journals, also known as serials, around the world. And this graph from the Association of Research Libraries is pretty powerful. That red line at the top is what we think of as serial expenditures, now called open resource expenditures. And so tracking from 1998 to 2018, we have this 166% increase in the costs for serials or journals um, from the, the 1998 timeframe. And what's interesting if you look at this graph is the total expenditures for library budgets is the third line, a light purple line, um, that's only increased about 68% in the last 20 years. And then kind of sad, the very bottom purple line is our book budgets or ebook budgets or our one-time monograph funds that's been uh, increasing about 23%. So um, even after adjusting for inflation, the real cost of serials continues to rise um, past our budgets. So our budgets are often stagnant or declining in libraries. And this is basically unsustainable. So it's part of why academic libraries have been big supporters of open access. Um, and we really want researchers and students to have what they need. So next we want to talk about some myths surrounding open access. Um, so first myth we have here is open access only benefits the readers, but not the authors. And yes, open access benefits readers, but it has huge benefits for authors as well. So if you're an author or you're an artist and you're creating, you're sharing your work on open access platforms, um, whether what you're sharing is a data set, a research article or film or other type of art, um, by sharing with open access, you're making it easier for the public and others to access your work. Um, so that means more exposure for your work um, and potential to influence practitioners, people in medical fields or technology fields or other artists, people writing policy. Um, they can take your findings and take your work and build on top of it um, or apply it to their fields. And with more people using your work, um, that can lead to higher citation rates. So this morning, actually, I was looking at um, Taylor and Francis, which is the publisher for journal articles and books. And I saw a number there that showed any journals in their, or sorry, any articles that they're publishing that are open access have higher citation rates. So that's pretty exciting if you're publishing your work through open access. Um, other benefits for authors include if you're writing grants and your grants require you to make your work available to the public. Um, open access can help you achieve that. And also if it's part of your value to um, have information that's easily accessible and at a very low cost, um, by making your work open access, you can help promote this idea of um, accessible and cheaper information. And then benefits for readers can include, um, you know, you can access some of this work easily. Um, and it makes it just more equitable. So researchers at any institution, whether a well-funded place or a place that doesn't have much funds to purchase information, um, everyone can access open access. Anyone with an internet connection can access materials in, the, in open access.
So we hear sometimes this myth um, that open access journals are low quality. So I'm gonna go to the next slide, thanks. So sometimes we hear people say, I've never heard of any quality open access publishers. And I think our response to that would be that there are high quality and low quality open access publishers, just as there are high quality and low quality traditional publishers. So this slide shows some examples that we think you've probably heard of. Um, in the commercial category, uh, some of these big publishers like Elsevier, Wiley, Taylor & Francis require article processing charges if you want to publish an open access article in one of their journals that otherwise may not be open access. Um, so these really depend on the publisher. For Sage, it might be about $200 an article. For Wiley, it might be $1,500 to $3,000 an article to publish an open access article. Um, in most cases, the default copyright or publishing agreement for even these big companies allows authors to self-archive. So you can put a copy of your work into an institutional repository like RCU Scholar. And if not, it's often possible to negotiate an author's agreement that lets you do that. And so that's one way of making your work open. In terms of societies, we've got a few big names listed here, but there's an interesting one. The American Anthropological Association has their cultural studies journal that became fully open access in 2015. Originally, it was a Taylor and Francis journal that required really high article processing charges. And this was a problem for anthropologists who don't always have the same funding as STEM researchers. So their whole association decided to move their journal to an open access platform. And then university presses are also recognizing the budget pinch and considering other publishing options. So some strategies that we suggest for looking at quality of open access publishers um, would be to review the editorial board for that publisher and get to know them a little bit, learn more about and vet the people and their website. Um, ask your colleagues in your field if they've heard of it, if it seems reputable, what experiences they may have had. I would also add talk with your librarian to see um, if your subject specialist knows about this publisher or could suggest others. Okay, back to you, Stacey. So a third myth we often hear is participating in open access can cost money. Um, so as Lynn's mentioned briefly, um, sometimes to publish in a journal, an open access journal, you need to pay the publisher a fee, but only one third of open access journals are charging this fee. Um, there is a way to not spend any money and that is through self archiving. Um, so if you put a paper in like our CU Scholar repository, um, that's essentially no cost. Um, if you do find that you need to pay um, to publish an article, there are a few different ways to maybe help to help you out with that. One is if you're writing a grant to include any open access charges into the grant application. Some institutions provide funding. So here at CU, we have the open access funds through the libraries and you can apply to receive some money to help cover costs of publishing. Um, some journals have a membership model. So if you become a member of their organization or of the journal, um, you can publish at a discounted rate or sometimes it's included into your membership. So you will just publish for free. Um, or you can also see if your library or your, the institution you're at will have an institution level membership that can help cover costs. Um, and some publishers will waive your fees if you cannot afford it. So if a journal really wants your article, um, you can talk to them and see if they can waive, waive that fee. So another myth that we sometimes hear is that publishing in an open access journal is the only way to practice open access. And we'd just like to dispel that. Um, I think it's easy when people get on the bandwagon of something to, uh, to get kind of righteous about it, but there's actually lots of different ways to participate in different levels. So for authors, for people producing content, we've talked about self-archiving, also called green open access. This often means putting your work into an institutional repository or maybe a subject-based repository like archive, A-R-X-I-V, that we looked at on that earlier slide for STEM just as an example. Um, often funding agencies are requiring this, which is really interesting. National Institutes of Health and other big 
medical funding agencies want the research that they fund to be made freely available. So often that's a requirement that we're seeing. Self-archiving is often a way of working with or around traditional publishers. Um, so that's, that's one benefit. It's pretty friendly to embargoes that some um, traditional publishers want you to wait anywhere between six months to a year to up to two years to produce, uh, to share your work freely. They wanna kind of have the edge on, on the latest scholarship. So self-archiving can work around that. And then we really love uh, Sherpa Romeo, this project where we've got the link here where you can type in the name of a journal and quickly see what their publishing agreements are, if they allow self-archiving and to what degree. So we love that. If you're thinking about publishing, Sherpa Romeo could be a good site to go explore the journals you're considering and see what are their policies if open access is something that's important to you. And then a gold open access, oftentimes this means supporting fully open access journals, but there's varying degrees. So it could mean that it's totally free to publish in an open access journal. It could mean that you're publishing in a journal that requires article processing charges to help with their economic model. Um, it could mean that you pay to retain certain copyrights or remove an embargo restriction. And the best scenario, the ideal would be that it would be free to publish and there would be no embargo restrictions. So those are some options for authors. We've got a couple suggestions on the next slide for learners or seekers of open access information. We mentioned our CU Scholar repository where you can find work by CU Boulder faculty, students, and staff. We've also recommended the Directory of Open Access Journals. So it's a registry of journals all over the world uh, based on discipline. Um, some are high quality, some are medium, some are low quality, but it's a great place to go find things and then explore and do your research on your own. And then we also like uh, Google Scholar. Sometimes you can click to get into a free version of a, an article that links to someone's institutional repository or there's a feature just below the title of each article called other versions. And that's often a good way to try to track down a freely available version of a paywall article. So those are a few options. So other things you can do to learn about open access, again, this was a very basic overview of it. Um, this presentation is part of a series of open scholarship beginners workshops, part of the Opentober 2020 events at CU Boulder. Um, so if you want to learn more, I suggest you check out the additional workshops that are happening throughout this month um, and the other Opentober events. Um, they're synchronous, some are videos or audio, um, others are take your own quiz, so please check those out. Um, if you're at CU Boulder, you can also look into our other open access initiatives like the Open Access Fund to request money to cover your publication fees. Um, we also have our policies there, um, information on repositories like CU Scholar and self-archiving and other places to find support. If you have additional questions, we recommend you get in touch with our scholarly communication librarian, Melissa Cantrell. And we also have a team of librarians here that um, are really into open access and copyright. And then you can email your questions to copyright at colorado.edu. Uh, we really want to thank Melissa Cantrell and Nicole eichmann Kalwara for sharing their content with us that we repurposed for this slide. And we'll love to use the rest of the half hour to answer any questions you may have, um, or feel free to follow up with us with our emails, which are listed here. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We'll hang out, I think, until till two.